So oftentimes it's the person with the idea or the vision of the big vision that's gonna drive things forward. Oftentimes that person is the person who should likely own the majority of the business. And then the person who's the high follow through, the, the integrator as they'd call it, is likely the person who's gonna own the minority of the business. Because the integrator is gonna be amazingly critical to the business, but the integrator is gonna execute and implement the ideas that are gonna grow it big and that are gonna, they're gonna really capture the market. But without the ideas, without the, the vision, uh, there's nothing to integrate, there's nothing to grow. The value is gonna be much lower. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Carrot Cast. Now, the Carrot Cast, we're usually diving in doing interviews with amazing real estate investors, amazing real estate agents. Now, in these episodes, every Thursday, they're the Trevor Truck Talks, where you get to hear behind the scenes of the mindset shifts I'm going through as a CEO of one of the fastest growing companies in America and the mindset shifts you can take to run your business and win back your freedom as well. Let's dive into this episode. I got a question for you guys. Have you ever had a business partner, wondered if you should get a business partner, um, or even honestly struggled with a business partner? Well, I want to do a two-part series on these Trevor Truck Talks. Uh, from the time that I dropped my youngest daughter off to school to the time that I get to the office, I was talking about partnerships and kind of walking through the journey of how I have had success with partnerships over the years and also where I have not. So um, the reason I wanted to bring this up right now is because especially as we step into this you know, in this new real estate market that we're going to be having the next five to 10 years, I think it's going to be really important that investors find ways to partner with each other, that agents find ways to partner with investors um, and vice versa. And I think partnerships can honestly be one of the, the things that's the lightning rod for you for success. And um, I want you to kind of think about this because there's a lot of people out there and a lot of wisdom that says, don't ever partner with anybody, right? Because there's, there's people that I know and love that have had really, really bad luck with partnerships and they have gotten burned before. Um, I've, I've not, I've never gotten burned per se on, on a partnership, but I have had some experiences that were not good and some that were, some that were great. Uh, my dad, he's been an entrepreneur for the past 20 or 30 years and um, he got burned by two partnerships, by, by like big time burn. Uh, one of them, we were out of town and he was 50, 50 partners with the guy, uh, starting the business that he owns today. And we came back from vacation and these people had basically moved my dad, who was the CEO of the company out of the office. Cause, cause they were using, uh, this new business was using, using this other partner's property, uh, to house the business on my dad was the, I think he was 51% owner or something like that. Anyway, they had taken all the client files. They had taken all the vendor files. They had basically told my dad, Hey, this business has to go now. This is after being in business for six to eight months, started, started a clientele, started a name, started those vendor relationships and said, um, you gotta be gone. And there wasn't any tiff. There wasn't anything like that. It was just big dishonesty. And that guy took all the vendor files, everything else started his own business and thought my dad was going to tuck his tail between the legs and run. And he didn't, uh, he went literally down the street, a quarter of a mile, uh, just scraped and scrapped and restarted that business. And it's bigger and badder today uh, by far than the other guys. And there was another one uh, where it was a property, real estate property. And he had partnered with a guy who was a contractor, didn't have the right agreement in place uh, legally, uh, just a handshake deal kind of a thing. And that guy took him for about $200,000 in that deal and took him to court, weren't able to get anything out of him and just got burned again. So when you have experiences like that, you know, it, it, it's going to jade you pretty heavily on the partnership side. Now, let me give you, let me give you my stories on partnerships now. So um, when I started as an entrepreneur, this would have been back in 2008 or so, uh, I started off on my own and I started off on my own. Uh, this is 2007, actually. I started off on my own trying to build some online companies and I had bought a, a rental property or two at that time. And I thought I, I, wa I wanted to do it on my own because I had seen those experiences that my dad had gone through. I didn't want to go through the same thing. I thought, you know what? I don't need a partner. I just need to figure this stuff out and I'll own 100% of the business. I don't want to give up any part of the business. And I started to build these little businesses. But the problem was they all stayed little because I have a certain skill set. I have a very certain skill set, y'all, which is I'm a visionary. I'm a starter. But I really, really do not like a bunch of other parts of business and work. I just don't like them. I'm not a very technical guy. I can make process, but I don't like to follow process. 
Um, you know, it's just a bunch of stuff like that. And so every time I would start something, it would get to this spot where I was really good at starting, but not good at following through on the idea and things would just never really grow. They would fizzle out. So my first real business that actually made any real money outside of rental properties uh, was an online company where we trained people in the real estate space. And uh, we primarily taught people how to raise private funds and, you know, for their real estate deals. If you guys know Tim Bratz, uh, Tim Bratz is a big multifamily investor now. Uh, he was one of our first customers. So literally his first deal, his first single family deal came from our program. His, uh, we taught him how to raise money in those early days in 2008. And he's just taken it and he's blowing up, of course, and doing, you know, teaching other people how to do the same thing, but 10 times bigger and 10 times better. And so the reason I bring this up is I had one skill set. I could launch a website, I could get traffic, I could create content, and I, and I had learned how to market. And um, I needed to find somebody else who had the skill set that was marketable, right? Because I didn't have a skill set that was marketable to the, to the market that people wanted. I just knew how to get marketing messages in front of people. And so I ended up becoming friends with the guy who literally commented on my blog. We reached out, said, hey, let's do some content together and deliver value for, for my audience. We did. People loved it. And they said, hey, wh- how can I learn more? I'd love to work with this guy. So he was really sharp. His name is Patrick. And so we ended up starting a business together and we grew that business for about four years or so. We never made millions on it, um, but we, we, we would do three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year and we were 50, 50 partners. And um, that one worked out pretty good, but here's the deal. Here's, here's tip number one on partnerships is we have to make sure that we're planning for the divorce first, okay? You always have to, in business, plan for the divorce first. You have to plan for, before you even sign on the, the dotted line that we're doing business together, what is my role and what is your role? You know, where do our roles separate and where, where might there be confusion between our roles? Um, how do we know when I'm delivering my value and you're delivering your value? How do we get paid? Even though we're 50-50 partners, do we get paid the, 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 you know, the same or do we get paid separately? Uh, and then if things don't work out, how do we part ways in this business? So we didn't have that in place in that first partnership. We didn't have it in place to where we made it clear how we would part ways. And here's what I mean. If one of you wants out of the business or you want the other person out of the business, you have to set a value or evaluation method for how one is going to buy the other out. Because what happens is when you're starting a business and the business is worth nothing, it's really easy for you to, to set these criteria because there's no money to squabble over. But as soon as there's money to squabble over, all of a sudden, even for the greatest people, some greed starts to pop up. And so we have to set, how are we going to evaluate the business from day one and put that in the operating agreement? Here's an example that we've done with Carrot. And, and you might update it from time to time to stay ahead. When things are good is the exact time to update your operating agreement. And when things are bad is when you wish you had updated the operating agreement sooner. Okay. So here's some examples with it. You want to lay out in clear detail how a partner could be expelled or expulsion clause from the business. So there's certain things that you can, you can put in there, work with an attorney to do this and lay out in clear detail what that looks like. Okay. And then number, number two is I would never suggest that you start a business being 50, 50 business partners. So that first partnership that I had, we were 50, 50 business partners. It worked out well, but uh, you guys have heard my story. I really got burnt out on that business. Um, we were, we had a great product. We had great customers. I love my business partner. We're still friends today. We still, we still run a mastermind today and we get together every single year for our mastermind. Um, but the, the difference was I had started to resent the fact that I felt I was doing most of the work that was bringing most of the value and we were splitting everything down the middle 50, 50. And so we have to, we have to protect ourselves and the other partner to eliminate or reduce the chance of resentment for your partner, okay? And so here's a couple of ways to do it. And this goes back to operating agreement, but also defining roles well, okay? So what we had done is number one, we had, we had discussed with each other early on that we'd be open and honest early and often uh, to make sure that we're having conversations about these types of things. And then we laid out a couple, a couple things as we went. Uh, before we started off just 50, 50 business partners, we would literally split, split the profits down the middle 50, 50 each month. And that worked, like I said, in the beginning. And then there started to be some resentment on my end. Um, because like I said, I felt that I was doing most of the work and bringing most of the value, but getting half the pay. 
and I'm just going, man, I, I, I just wonder if I should just start my own business. I love my business partner, partner, but I'm starting to have kids now. And, and this just isn't working out. Right. And so we had basically adjusted it and said, okay, well, where is it that Trevor brings the value and where is it that the Patrick brings the value? And at that time he brought the value by going out and speaking at live events. Um, he brought the value by going on and doing webinars with people. I brought the value by bringing in affiliate partners and, and, um, and doing the marketing. And so we basically said any revenue that's generated from the activities that Patrick mostly does speaking, things like that, he gets 60%. I get 40%. Any revenue that I primarily do, which is managing the email list and, and doing promotions and thing like things like that, I get 60% he gets, and he gets 40%. So it added that extra motivation for us to put that time into doing the work that we were good at. And that worked out. Um, and then, and then, um, because we didn't have a clause in place to value the company, when I was wanting to move on, I just told him, cause I didn't want to create a riff in the partnership. I just told him, I said, you know what you, Patrick, just tell me what price you want for my half of the company. I will say yes, whatever price it is, cause I don't want to have a negotiation with you. And I want to, I want to keep our relationship intact. And so he gave me a price. It was way worth way less than it was, than it was worth, I feel. Um, but I was, I was joyful because I was able to get my time back. He was able to buy the business and, and guys, that business went from doing half a million a year to doing a million a month now. And the cool thing was he was able to basically step into my role. Okay. He stepped into my role, which was the marketing side of it. And he's crushing it there. He's way better at that role than I was at the writing copy and, and coming up with hooks and stuff like that. And I flip flopped to the other side. I love putting out content. I love doing this and helping people from, from the front. And so he stepped to the back where I was, I stepped to the front where he was. We went off and started new businesses or, you know, he kept that one and grew it. And I, and I started this one and grew it and it's, we're still amazing friends. Okay. So that was business one. And that was some of the lessons learned there is we didn't have a buyout clause. So I didn't want to create a negotiation and I just said, give me a number. And he did. And I accepted it. Okay. So if you're willing to do that as a founder, just have the other person give you a number and you trust them. Then awesome. You don't need a buyout clause. But if you're worried about that, you need a buyout clause that shows how you, how you evaluate the business. If it's a real estate business, it might be something like three to five times profits, okay, annual profits or EBITDA. So if you profit, let's say $200,000 a year, or your, or your part of profits is $200,000 a year, or the company's profits is $200,000 a year, then you might take a 3x of that and the business is worth uh, $600,000. If you own 50% of that, your share is worth $300,000 likely. Okay. And now the next question is, is the business worth less with you out of it? Like, did you play a key role in the business that if you're gone, that, that, that business won't be able to operate without you? Well, if that's the case, the business is not worth $600,000 now, because, because if the second you go away, if the second you go away, that other founder has to hire someone at a hundred thousand dollars a year, $80,000 a year to do your job. Now the business is not worth that much. It's just not. Okay. So that, that's the tricky part. So you have to peg how you guys do valuations. Okay. Number two is, uh, when I started carrot, uh, actually I'll, I'll give you another one. So this is one that didn't work out around that same time. I started a business partnership where I was actually the minority owner. I was 25% owner of this software company. And once again, a good friend of mine, he was the, um, 75% and then I invested in a different software company that he owned where I'm a small share uh, owner under, under 5% owner on that. And so with that one, for me, that was a passive investment. I'm like, I'm going to put in this money. I hope it grows, but I'm not really involved in it. I might give them some advice from time to time. That one worked out great. Okay. That one worked out great. That business now will do probably close to $10 million next year. I own a hunk of that business. I'm still involved as an advisor. I'm so proud of that founder and entrepreneur. It's amazing. The other business with him did not work out because same, same situation, guys. I was running the day-to-day -day of that other software company before Carrot. I only own 25% and I didn't have a clause in place to allow me to earn more equity as we went. And I started the same thing. I started to grow resentment. I'm like, man, I love my business partner. I love this business, but I can't be the guy growing this business basically 90% by myself. Okay. I can't do that and own 25% of the business. I need to take this energy and grow it and, and put it into something where I can grow a big asset that is protecting me and my family for the long term. And so I negotiated with him to see if I could buy more than 50% of the business and it just didn't work out. So that one ended, um, I, I sold him back my shares of that business for what I bought into it for, which was only a, about five or $6,000. Uh, he graciously bought it back and that business ended up 
you know, dying over the next year or so. Okay, so that one did. But the other software company I invested in with him did not die. It thrived, but I was fine in my position in it because it required zero work of me. So that's lesson number two in partnerships is you have to look at how much work each partner is going to put into the business. Okay, each, each, you have to um, look at the work that each partner is going to put into the business. And then you have to make sure you guys are okay being compensated accordingly. Okay. It can't be that the person that's going to be literally growing the company, if they're okay with it, that's going to be doing that is going to be a minority shareholder, unless they're going to get a big fat old salary that's coming out of somewhere, right? That's not just coming out of the cash flows that that person produces, because that's a quick recipe for resentment, a quick recipe for that person who's driving the business at a minority stakeholder to really step away. Okay. I was the one driving the business, not just a key employee. Okay. So that's the difference. If you have a key employee or if you are a key employee uh, for a business, we have to ask ourselves, how critical is that person in the, the, the success of this business? Like if that person were to be gone, could they be replaced? Maybe not easily, but could they theoretically be replaced uh, at or close or maybe a little bit above the salary that they were already at without having to change a bunch of equity? And, and usually, you know, most employees are providing a really amazing direct value to the business. But most employees, uh, if something were to happen, we could, you know, there, there, someone else could be found in the open market that could do their job. Right. And so that's the question is it's not, if you're a key employee, um, you know, that there should, should be equity there all the time. It's not that just because you're driving the business forward, um, that you should have this massive chunk of equity. And that's, you know, I'll give you a criteria, a, a, a difference here is if you were one of the founders who literally started the business, okay, that's what I'm talking about. I was one, I was a co-founder with him to start the business. And then I was going to basically grow, grow it from a couple grand. It was like it's $1,500 a month in revenue. And we're going to grow it to a seven figure business. So that's the difference. If you're stepping into a business as a partner, or if you're stepping into a business as an employee or key employee, that's already existing, that's already got momentum, that's already thriving, that's already started to find their, their groove, uh, without you, then that's where equity oftentimes doesn't make sense for the founder. And it doesn't make sense for that, that extra partner, that extra business partner to be brought on at that point, usually. Okay. So I've, I'm going to give one more tip in this part of the series. And then for partnerships uh, on the second part of this, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about not just like actual business partnerships where you're a, you're a shareholder in the same company. I'm going to talk about partnerships that are not where you own the company with the person, but where you partner with them on deals or you partner with them in certain ways. And, and I have several of those. I have several of those where I am a partner with people on deals, but I'm not in business with them. Okay, so that's gonna be the second part of it. I think that's probably the biggest opportunity uh, for that. So the third part of it here, guys, in partnerships is you have to make sure that you your partner is kind of the yin to your yang, okay? Your partner should be the yin to your yang. What do I mean by that? what I mean by that is in my first business businesses that I had talked about, the reason they didn't grow is because I had a certain skill set to start businesses and um, think of marketing hooks and stuff, but not the rest of it. And so with Carrot, <clears throat> this is where I really figured that part of it out. Okay. Because in the first business, there was a, the, the publishing company, there was a little bit of yin to the yin to the yang there, right? I did the marketing stuff and I was behind the scenes. And I built the business and then he was the guy out front teaching. Now we had learned, like I said, that we should have been in opposite roles because I didn't get energy from being behind the scenes and doing that stuff. And he didn't get energy from being in front of people. I get energy from teaching and educating like this. And he gets energy from being behind the scenes crafting amazing copies. So we were just in the wrong roles. So we were, we were yin to the yang, but we were in the wrong roles and things that weren't giving us the right energy. The next business, the one that failed that I own 25% in, we were pretty much the same person. Like we had the same Colby score. We, we are both starters. We're both visionaries. Uh, that's, it didn't work, right? We were the same person. And that's why he had me take over in that because uh, because he was needed to run the other company that, that I invested in the other software company. And uh, I stepped into this one. It just didn't work, okay? So the third business then with, with Carrot, uh, I knew that I couldn't build the tech side of it. So I needed someone who could do that. And I'm a starter. I needed a high follow-through person. I'm a visionary. I needed a person who could take the vision and distill it down into actionable steps that we could actually do. And whenever we hire people, and what I would suggest that you do as, a, as an entrepreneur, if you're a real estate investor, or real estate agent looking for a partner, is have both of you take the Colby test, okay? K-O-L-B-E, the Colby test. 
the Colby test is going to give you basically uh, the way that you work. And it's on four quadrants. We've talked about this on, on uh, the podcast before. But basically, the first thing that it grades you on is um, they call it a fact finder. Like, do you like to research a lot before you make a decision? And it's one to 10. I'm a six fact finder, guys. Like, you do not want me to buy airplane tickets because it's going to take me three hours to do it because I'm going to look at every little detail of everything. So that's why my, uh, my assistant does all that kind of stuff. So high fact finder. Do I have to go through a lot of information to make big decisions? I've had to learn how to make quicker decisions now uh, this past year or two. Number two is quick start. Uh, so... Uh, are you a person who's a visionary, who likes to start things, who, who's okay with having three or four books half read, half read, who, who's okay with bouncing around between things? Um, one out of 10, I'm an eight. I'm an eight quick start. Okay. And then the third one is follow through, which means how likely are you to follow through on things that are started? Do you like checklists? Do you like to, to put things in order and knock them down and not start anything new until you get those things done? I'm a two on follow through. Okay. And then the last one, I don't remember what it is. So my co-founder, Chris on, on, on Carrot, he is more like a, a three, three, two or three on quick start. He's like a six on follow through. I don't remember what he's in the other ones, but on the Colby score, they say that you don't want, that if you have, if, if two people are more than four numbers apart on any given thing, that there likely will be some sort of conflict. So if I'm an eight on quick start and he's a two on follow through, you know, what is that? We're six numbers apart which means there will be some conflict that you've got to work through. It doesn't mean you can't work together. That's actually a pretty darn good yin to the yang, right? But we've got to make sure that we're communicating well because there will likely be conflicts coming up where I'm wanting to start new things all the time. And he's like the, the, the breaks going, no, no, no. We, we like, stop. We, what about these other ideas we already talked about over here? In the first couple of years, there was a lot of that where I probably frustrated the crap out of him and, and he frustrated the crap out of me. But we talked early on and said, let's work through this together and figure out new processes, new, new ways to communicate. And so now we have, you know, we, we've done it really, really well. I know that I can't walk into a meeting and just throw out 10 new ideas. Uh, and, and, but, but if I do, he knows that all, all that I need is for them to be acknowledged. And then for someone to say, okay, cool, let's, how important are these? And do you think that these are more important than the things we've already agreed on? If not, let's put them over in the parking lot so we can look at them later. I'm like, oh, cool. Awesome. And then, then my need for, for starting or getting things out of my brain is out. Okay. My need is out and his need for making sure that, sure that we're working on the things we've already committed to is also out. Okay. So it's that communication. So that's number three is you've got to find the end of your gang. I get energy from being out front. He does not get energy from being out front. I get energy from the vision from thinking one, two, three years out. He gets energy there a little bit now too, but his energy really comes from crafting the process and crafting the things to get it done. Alex, my, my VP of operations now, he was our first intern. He's also a high follow through. I think he's a six or seven follow through. He's a two or three or four quick start. So he likes to start some things, but he also is a follow through guy. And so for me as a really high quick start, I've got to have more high follow throughs around me to counterbalance my insanely high quick start. And so if you're looking to start a business or if you're looking to team up with someone as a real estate agent or an investor, you have to look at and say, what are the skill sets that you have? What are the skill sets I have? What's the Colby score you have? What's the Colby score I have? And they've got to be different. They've got to be complementary. Okay. If you love being out front and selling and you hate everything that is involved around the running of the business, the books, the financials, the accountability of the stuff, the projects, the following through on things, then you should probably go find a darn business partner who loves those because you're going to be stifling yourself and stifling your business. If you do not find those people, okay, give up a portion of the business to do that. And oftentimes this is how it works. Oftentimes it's the person with the idea or the vision of the big vision that's going to drive things forward. Oftentimes that person is the person who should likely own the majority of the business. And then the person who's the high follow through, the, the integrator, as they'd call it, is likely the person who's going to own the minority of the business, okay? And here's why. Because the integrator is going to be amazingly critical to the business, but the integrator is going to execute and implement the ideas that are going to grow it big and that are going to, they're going to really capture the market. But without the ideas, without the, the vision, uh, there's nothing to integrate. There's nothing to grow. The value is going to be much lower. Okay. But on the other side of it, with just ideas, with no person to integrate and to drive those forward, your ideas aren't worth very much. They're not worth anything if they're not getting implemented. So I would suggest that the visionary, 
uh, the person who has the, the idea, who, who is able to sell that idea well, the person who's going to drive the innovation on that idea, uh, you should own more than 50% of the business, okay? I, I own about 78% of Carrot, and it works pretty darn well. Uh, but as we go, there will be opportunities then to give up portions of equity and carrot for those who are then going to drive the business forward. So uh, we have integrators who own the other portions of the company, but moving forward, it's likely going to be the drivers, the people who are driving the business forward actively in innovation and in those areas, revenue drivers who are going to be the ones getting the next potential chunks of phantom equity if we were, if we were to ever, ever do that. Okay. So that's the third part. First part is guys plan the the divorce before you get, get, get the marriage happening. Okay. Uh, part of that's the valuation, the whole thing. Um, the next part, I can't remember what it was. (laughs) The next part I'm going to say was this right here. Make sure that you are clear, uh, that you guys have the yin to the yang and, um, the other part, go back and check that out. But guys, I'm going to do the next part in this series, which is going to be, uh, what about starting a partnership that does not involve you guys actually owning a business together, you know, partnering with an agent, partnering with an investor, partnering with people outside of your, your, your industry potentially to grow your business and grow value. I think that's where the big opportunity is for all of y'all. So I'll walk through exactly how to do that. What opportunities I see for you as an agent or an investor to partner better and more effectively this year. Partnerships that I have that, that where I do not own parts of a business with the person guys bring in for me, probably about 150 to $250,000 a year. Okay. That literally would not happen at all. If I wasn't able to take what I'm good at and what they're good at, mash them together into a partnership for that one specific deal or that one specific purpose. And I'll make, you know, a couple hundred grand a year from partnerships alone <clears throat> outside of uh, what I do here at Carrot. So guys, I'll, t- I'll show you guys how to do that there. Have an amazing rest of the week. This is a little longer than I was, I was expecting. But um, hopefully, hopefully you got some value out of it. All right, guys, go rate and review this episode on Apple iTunes. Guys, go follow us on YouTube. I'm going to be doing big, big, big time uh, pushes on YouTube this year. It's going to be one of my big focuses, actually. Um, this year is growing more YouTube content. So go to YouTube, look up Carrot or Investor Carrot, Agent Carrot. You'll find us. Look up me. And uh, guys, dive in because we're going to be putting out so much more consistent, amazing content. DM me on Instagram and let me know what content you would love to hear. Okay, find me Trevor.mock. That's M-A-U-C-H. DM me over there. I answer all my DMs personally. What content would you love to see on our on our YouTube videos or hear here on the podcast, guys? We love you. Have an amazing rest of the week.